Jason can do. Okay, so welcome. I'm Ellie Noah. Thanks, Corey. Where's Corey? Corey. And thanks, uh, Raul, wherever he is, and Bob, he's here, and Jason in particular, uh, who's kind of organized all this. It happens to be his birthday tomorrow, tomorrow. so we kind of going to give it. No, 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 no. Hopefully. Thank you. Hopefully. All right. So uh, as you probably noticed, this is a busy time in New York. Uh, there's Obama and 35 other presidents and 60 heads of government and state and foreign ministers by the load. Uh, so just about everybody's here, including you. Great. But it also means everything is crowded. We're expecting 100 people to have registered here. They're probably sitting in some cab on the east side waiting <laughs> to, get, to get through. And the program here is also crowded, so I, um, I uh, will be get going. Because I do want to talk about a big picture thing, which is where the media system is going, who the main players will be, what the market structure will be, what the challenge will be for today's major network players, and what the policy issues will be. So there's a lot of ground to cover. Let me get started here. Let me see. Try to get started. Here we go. Okay, you all heard about Moore's Law. Um, Intel billionaire, he is the guy on the left. Um, and Mo uh, Gordon Moore postulated the 40% of a doubling every two years, which is uh, 18 months even. That's about a growth rate of 40% for information technology. And that's kind of been pretty much the pace of change. Um, but in, in the media field, things were much, much slower. We are kind of really into the third generation of television after 70 years. Many of the, many of the um, television sets that were used 50 years ago in many parts of the world would still be functioning today. So there's been a very slow and gradual change. Uh, and that rate of change, I would like to uh, give the name of Sarnoff, David Sarnoff, Sarnoff's rate. David Sarnoff and uh, RCA controlled the technology for several decades, and so he should be remembered also by Sarnoff's rate. And Sarnoff's rate, by my calculation, is about 4% a year, not 40%. And now the, that was possible because the control of intermediaries distribution system control the technology that went in, kind of the hardware, the software, uh, and the content, and, and the protocols, and it was internationally and nationally agreed on a very slow process. As a consequence, uh, this thing was highly controlled and very, s in technology terms, and, and slow moving. But now it is changing. The video is moving to the internet. Of course, we know that. But it's not just having more content, more specialized content, more cats on skateboard type content or whatever. But it also means in technological terms that that control over the pace of standardized technology is disappearing in favor of a much more computer internet oriented rate of change. In other words, that the whole video environment, television environment, whatever it means today, is moving from Sarnoff's rate to Moore's rate change. And that has a lot of implications. Now, we already kind of have seen, simply on the user level, kind of enormous, enormous. What the hell is this thing? This thing is. No, no, Ellie, you're using the wrong one. This is one. Okay. You can just click that. Yeah. And then you have the laser in there, too. It's not working. Oh, that's because it's not working. Oh. All right, that helps. No, it's still not. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have kind of enormous adoption of video at, 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 a, at, a, at an enormous rate. Uh, today, in fact, by our calculation, in uh, prime time, what is, or whatever called prime time on television, prime time hours, 95% in America of internet traffic is video traffic, 95%. And that is kind of keeps increasing at an enormous rate. So, so basically, the internet is becoming a um, a video entertainment type medium uh, uh, quite quite rapidly. And so, what are some of the implications? 
Well, it's of course been, all these things have been noted. They're nothing new. Um, but more on the level of another platform for distribution. So we have cable, we have satellites, now we have the internet. Great. Okay. But I think it's really much more than that. In the same way that the kind of the change in the medium leads to a change in the message, medium message. Uh, here too, in the same way that film changed, was not just theater stored and distributed in new ways, but led very rapidly to a different content and industry model. So it will be here. So it's not just Hulu, the same series uh, or kind of related series. Uh, now the technology elements, uh, we, some of them we know. There's the interactivity, uh, vertical interactivity as, as championed by, uh, pioneered by games. Uh, there's the horizontal peer-to-peer -peer as, 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 as pioneered by, um, by, by virtual <coughs> worlds, avatars in which we can project ourselves into the action. This is us, just better looking. Um, or we can, we can have kind of the virtual reality. This is an early model. It was not a consumer success. <laughs> however, however, kind of now, now we are <laughs> Now we're here, and so this kind of enables kind of a integration of reality with, with, with virtuality um, and social networking in which people now can superimpose themselves and through comments and even, even commentaries uh, 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 on television. Uh, with television and immersion technology 360 degrees in, in both dimensions, uh, or three dimensions, uh, I suppose. So, so, and, and a emerging um, software discipline called content engineering in which you develop personalization tools and participation tools and authoring tools that are kind of going to be the modules for that new creativity. Now, obviously, it's not going and, and some of these things will be pioneered by advertising, to, to personalize it, to target it, to individualize it, but eventually these techniques will migrate from advertising also to content <coughs> itself. Now obviously not all of television will be like that, but it'll be the leading edge. The transition will be soft, there'll always be kind of different degrees in, in, in let's say game shows there will be more participation and in other political shows there probably will be less and so on. Now, where does this lead us? What is the media industry structure of that fourth generation of television? First was broadcasting, second was multi-channel, third is now digital, and this would be f the fourth one. Who are some of the big players? Well, here's an example. Apple as a node, as a central facility, Google as a central facility. These are big, expensive electronics choked choke type environments. Um, what we kind of call clouds or will be calling clouds, the Netflix, the Hulus, uh, the Amazons, uh, the YouTubes, uh, the Daily Motions, and, and what have you. Um, but it is important for us not to think of this only as a vi video on demand, as a VOD on steroid, steroid type, type stuff, because it will change the medium in a significant way. But first, Let's see, why will these clouds, um, and I'm kind of expanding the terminology here, why will the, these video clouds be dominant? And I think there are at least eight reasons. Uh, one of them is the diversity of options. Television will not be television singular, but televisions plural, because there will be all these elements and modules provided by different providers with different technologies, at different development rates from different countries and different industries and they have to be integrated in some fashion. That kind of end-to-end -end is not likely to work, although some people, of course, will create that end-to-end -end model, an Apple-like model, but others will be much more federated. And in that situation, those intermediaries will play a significant role because they are the ones who will be the integrators. Um, Similarly, there's the issues of standards. Uh, the, the different standards and protocols have to be coordinated in some fashion with each other. And in the middle will be clouds that essentially function as the, opera as the bridge operators for different technologies and different standards. Uh, then there is the convenience. 
As you know, when kind of ever you go to these trade, trade shows, I was in, at IFA in Berlin just a few days ago, a few, uh, two weeks ago, and, and they, they show these kind of brilliant images of kind of things working with each other. But you know that this is really the reality, right? Um, and, 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 and so in that situation, which becomes basically impossible for people to integrate anymore unless they're really into the stuff, um, but not on the consumer level, you have integrators in the middle who essentially put these things together. Those are the clouds. That, incidentally, is also a real problem for the consumer electronics industry because beyond just being input-output devices like the big panels, uh, the, everything that's behind it really should be, could be done in the cloud further away um, uh, rather than by consumers trying to kind of integrate this. Now, there's law and regulation, different rules apply in different countries, different content, different technologies. Okay, here too, in compliance with these laws and these regulations, clouds have the advantage of scale so that not every operator, not every provider of a module has to comply with 200 different countries. The, 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 um, the, the, the clouds can do that for you. And then there is, and I'll just list them here, the, the finance, kind of who gets what money allocated. Uh, there's a function for, the, for, for clouds, the branding, quality control, the privacy and security, and the personalization. They can personalize because they have the information. They know what you like, what you have done in the past. You have given them some information directly and through your behavior, and that will kind of therefore enable personalization. So, um, uh, now let me get to the last, last part of my talk, which is competition issues here. Uh, and here, give me a second. And here the main question perhaps is the impact of this cloud TV system on network providers. I can also talk about traditional impact on traditional media, I just don't have the time. Uh, so on network providers. And in, in short, there's an enormous gain in traffic, good for network providers, but there's also an enormous loss of control, bad for network providers. The gain in traffic is, is pretty obvious because kind of when people watch television or whatever it is all the time um, over these kind of networks, there's a lot more traffic. These are essentially the links for network providers in which they make some connections. Um, and there will be a lot of traffic. Uh, on the other hand, who controls these links? And because they all terminate in a cloud provider, the cloud provider has that ability to to let people connect or not connect, to strike deals or not strike deals. And so in that environment, with transmission essentially a commodity and cloud provisions, as I will show you in a moment, not a commodity but an oligopoly probably, there is an imbalance in bargaining power, in market power, and so therefore, in effect, the cloud provider can pretty much uh, determine determine what kind of deals there would be in transmission. And you can see that already what, uh, um, um, uh, uh, where this kind of some, some operators have already done that. Um, so, so in that situation, it's a bit like a market industry structure where you are a tire manufacturer and you want to supply, supply tires to an automobile maker, okay? The automobile maker in that environment almost invariably will have the upper, upper hand. Um, and so why would the network, why would the clouds have market power? Well, for several reasons. It basically one of scale and economies of scale and high capital cost. That means high fixed cost and low marginal cost and that kind of suggests scale. You can see here, I'll show you two, just two graphs quickly on work that we've been doing here. That if you compare traditional media, 20th century media and Internet media, internet media are in every region of the world more concentrated. If you look at it from a, a ratio of, t of c total assets, that is capital intensity and media and concentration, the vertical being HHI, market concentration, the horizontal being the capital intensity, you also see that there is a direct kind of uh, relationship 
Um, and these are very, so clouds are very capital intensive. Therefore, there will a rel be a relatively small number of, uh, of clouds around. So, um, so what, what is therefore the imp implication for the network providers? They're basically, there are four options here, and none of them particularly good. The first one is product differentiation, kind of get out of commodity space by being different. But in transmission, this is not an easy thing to do. Think about it. I mean, what are you going to use? Can, I'm faster, maybe. I'm cheaper, maybe. But it's basically, it's a commodity business. Secondly is, um, is to be a cloud yourself, vertical integration. That has several issues. One of them is maybe cable companies can do it. Telecom companies already have a hard time. Once you get beyond the hardware aspect, uh, which, of course, is a, kind of something that they could do, but once you get into the content modeling integration, there is no history of skills in this area in particular. So this will be the challenge. Plus, there will be regulatory challenges of vertical integration, this net neutrality debate, uh, and so on. The third one is the commercial deals and alliances. And here, that kind of would be the most obvious, obvious conclusion, but it would leave some companies out, and it the imbalance of bargaining strength that I described is going to be also a problem. But it is the most likely um, uh, resolution. And the last one is regulated access. Um, regulated access. Now think about that. Think about kind of an environment in which the ISPs and the network operators go to regulators and say, give us access. And they will talk about net neutrality, and they will talk about non-discrimination, and they will talk about unbundling. Wouldn't this be ironic how these, how the kind of how these debate will be shifted? And so my advice to um, to to um, to the participants in this debate is in the net neutrality debate is burn your briefs because <laughs> it is only a short time before before the logic of market power will reverse itself. And in that environment, you are likely to have to kind of make the arguments that you opposed in the past on both sides. So, okay, there are other issues too, which I cannot now cover, such as, for example, the cloud to cloud interoperability so that we don't have islands in the stream, but more of a kind of an archipelago system. Uh, there's mo much more to talk about, but I'd like uh, these kind of very interconnection issues, but I'm getting dirty looks from Bob. Uh, so let me finish with uh, clouds. Joni Mitchell, uh, and she says, I've looked at clouds that way, but now they only block the sun, they rain and snow and everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in my way. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down, and still somehow it's cloud illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. <laughs> and and this is what this project that we are doing at Columbia on cloud television is trying to do, hopefully with your help. Thank you. <laughs>